since December of 2017, we have all been told a story. There's a whole fleet of them, look on the ASA. A story about a $22 million secret Pentagon UFO study and the man who ran it. But now, nearly four years later, a new book has turned much of this story upside down. According to this book, those original stories were all wrong. And what we thought we knew is not the case. This new book, according to page 160 anyway, aims to simply correct the record. Oh, we found a lot. But does it? Think, uh, Should we dismiss the old claims and make room for the new ones? Although not all of the original claims are being challenged, which do we choose to believe and which do we choose not to believe? This is the story about why for the past nearly four years, the saga that has involved ATIP, OSAP, UFOs, a ranch in Utah infested by the paranormal and multiple former government personnel is still riddled with confusion and lingering questions, even with this new book that aims to correct the record. Stay tuned. You're about to journey inside the Black Vault. That's right, everybody. As always, thank you so much for tuning in and making this your podcast or your live stream of choice. I'm your host, John Greenwald Jr., founder and creator of TheBlackVault.com, and I know that on this channel, I've been a little bit quiet lately. For that, I do apologize. Work has been a little bit crazy, uh, and uh, sadly, that does have to take precedence over what I love doing, and that is creating these videos and these types of presentations for all of you. Now, for those who aren't aware, sometimes I will do behind the scenes videos live. Now, if you're watching this live, welcome. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. If you're watching the pre-recorded version that drops later, that's a little bit more professionally edited and, and cut together, just know subscribe to this channel. That way you get notified when I do the live streams and you can take part. Uh, any of those who are currently watching live, you may see their questions come in. Super chats are open. It's a way to support this channel and it helps me get research like this done. It always isn't free uh, to start digging into some of this stuff and some of those FOIA requests do yield uh, some high uh, dollar price tags. 100% of what comes in through those super chats go right into this channel and the website to create this type of content. So if you do decide to support, Awesome, thank you for that. If you can't, don't worry about it. Everything is still free, but the biggest uh, help that you can give is spreading the word. Now today, what I'm going to be going over is something that has been a hot topic in the UFO world or on Twitter, as some like to call it, hashtag UFO Twitter, and that is the new book, Skinwalkers at the Pentagon. Now I wanna show you guys this because this is a, a, a copy that I purchased. Uh, I had posted on social media that I recommend if you guys are interested, support the authors. There may be some stuff that I go over today where you may question the authors. Uh, that's healthy. I hope that I don't offend anybody by questioning some of the information, but in the same respect, I support published authors. And so I've seen a lot of people really start scanning and taking pictures and posting things on social media that includes full chapters and stuff like that. I don't support that. What I do support are taking quotes, which is what I'm going to do. And you may see some some pages from the book just know all of those pages are on the amazon free preview so i am not showing you guys anything you can't see for free on amazon's free preview but again i want to at least uh, plug that uh, ahead of time that i do recommend buying the book if you want to know the full story that's the only way you're going to get it you're not going to get it from me because i don't go over everything and you're not going to see it on social media plus it's not fair so i do want to give my show of support for those authors because what they have done 
and this is what I want to kind of go over here, is essentially bring one man forward that has yet to come forward since December or arguably October of 2017, but since this whole ATIP story broke. Now, we didn't know about OSAP uh, until a few months thereafter, but essentially this was the man, Dr. James Lekatsky, that uh, ran a, another program, not ATIP, but OSAP, in the Defense Intelligence Agency. He has been mum up until the last few weeks since this book came out. So that to me is the biggest revelation from this book because now we're getting somebody's side that we have never heard before. But in that process, there has been massive confusion that has reigned not only with the uh, last three, four years since since the New York Times and Politico broke, uh, Politico broke the ATIP story, but this doesn't help in the sense to clear up all of that confusion. I'm not blaming the book or the authors, but rather I'm showing you guys everything is not cleared up as some want us to believe. There are still massive massive amounts of confusion with all of this. But then on top of that, there are still many questions that have yet to be answered. So let me go ahead and bring up the presentation that I want to do for you guys. And this will go over why that confusion continues to reign when it comes to OSAP and ATIP and why questions continue to linger about OSAP and ATIP. Because I see differing viewpoints here that some want us to believe everything is transparent and has been out there for years. There's just lazy people out there that don't want to look at the facts. Well, I'm here to tell you, I don't consider myself lazy. I'm a lot of things, as some people will tell you. Uh, sadly, lazy is not one of them. I'd love to put my feet up and, and uh, not really do anything, but rather uh, I dig in. And I follow as much as I can about all of this. And there is a lot of it. So what I want to show you guys today is why that confusion reigns and the questions continue to linger. So let me go ahead and uh, get my proper PowerPoint presentation here. Give me one second. Now, before I dig into some of that stuff, I want to tell you guys a little bit about me personally on how I approach research. I would say the criticism that I get, I love the praise, but I also love the criticism because it helps me become better. But one point of criticism that some people don't like me over is what they may call the minutia of the stories, uh, that they feel that I nitpick, that I go too far into trying to pick apart what people say or what people do uh, or you know whatever it might be. And for me, the way that I um, approach these types of topics and why I disagree with that criticism, and, and I want to kind of give you guys a, a little bit of a visual representation on why I do what I do, but how I do what I do, and that is why the minutia matters. Now, I look into every topic like a puzzle. That's how I visualize it in my mind. For 25 years, I've run the Black Vault. That's what I do. There are thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of pieces of that puzzle, and we put it together to create a picture. <clears throat> now, some people out there, and this is, this is kind of my, I would say, point of frustration sometimes, and you'll see where I do get frustrated on social media, uh, is they're cool with the outer layers right? They're, they're cool putting the puzzle together. And if they see that there's trees there, there's some leaves, maybe a building back here, uh, that's all that matters to them. And, and they feel that they have the full picture because, well, what's in the middle here? You know, grass, maybe another building. Who really cares? We, we have enough of the picture to believe that this is an outdoor scene. And that's how they approach research. Well, I'm different. I've got to put everything together because when you do, and you put every single piece of the puzzle together, another one usually emerges. A full different perspective of what you thought was there when you just looked at the outer layer, um, it's different. And those pieces of the puzzle, the center, the minutia, the little details, when you start picking apart all of the stories and how everybody talks about this or that, when you put it together, a lot of times and arguably most of the time, you get a completely different picture 
as what you see here. So you don't have everything, you think one thing, you have it all, you see something completely different. That's how I have always approached research, and that is what the Black Vault is all about. Now credit to this amazing artist, Oleg Shuplayek, I probably have that pronounced incorrectly. Google him, he's got some awesome stuff. Uh, I created the puzzle out of one of his paintings, um, but uh, again, that is the best vis visualization uh, and simplistic way of looking at how I approach research. Now, some of what I go over may be review for some of you who, like me, have lived and breathed this since October of 2017. Why I say October and not December, that is when Luis Elizondo entered the scene. That was when he talked about an aerospace threat program that was identifying these types of threats, but he never said ATIP in October. That was not broken until December. That October press conference by To The Stars Academy introduced Luis Elizondo to the world, and that was where I became incredibly intrigued about what was rumored to be this secret UFO program. Fast forward then from October to, to December of that same year, New York Times and Politico breaks the story. December 16th, 2017, in my opinion, will forever change ufology in the sense that it created this firestorm of publicity for this program called ATIP, the reality that unidentified aerial phenomena were being investigated by the U.S. government, or at least that's what we were told in December. And since then, a lot of stuff has happened. You see that on this channel. I try and cover it when I can, but also in the mainstream media in the last, uh, really in the last year and a half, especially since that UA UAP report uh, came out. And so that's why I say that it will forever change ufology, the study of, of UFOs. And, and that's what these two articles were. As we dig deeper and look at the confusion in those questions, I'm going to bring up something that upsets a lot of people. And to be quite frank and blunt, I, I, those that do get upset that I bring this up, I don't care. And here's why it's those my minute details, the small details. And that was what I a tip actually stood or stands for uh, in that in that New York Times article, and the Politico article, we were getting two different names for what a tip was. So in essence, the confusion for those who were paying attention to those small details started on day one. Now, some of you may not think this is a big deal. And this is one of those things that again, upsets some people that I brought up in the past, uh, but continue to make reference to, because again, this is what started the snowball of confusion. It was simple as a single word in the letter, uh, excuse me, in the acronym of aerospace versus aviation. New York Times reported advanced aerospace threat identification program, Politico advanced aviation threat identification program. Why does that matter? It's plain and simple. It's research. When you look into something, you need those names to be accurate. And yes, FOIA offices, if you don't have keywords right or full names correct, uh, there is uh, sometimes an issue with that. And so, yes, I brought that up uh, quite early on because the Pentagon had uh, said it was advanced aviation. I don't regret that at all, pushing that, that uh, point. And in fact, I'm glad I did because it really brought quite a bit more out about the reality of ATIP and what it was. And according to the government, what it wasn't. It doesn't matter if you believe the government or not. It doesn't matter if I believe the government or not. But the pushing of that brought more details out, including how it was funded. And I'll show you that in a minute, uh, but also some other details as well. But where it really got worse and dicey was all of these different variations of the name just beyond what Politico and New York Times had reported. But as these stories were being written, all sorts of names emerged. And what was concerning to me was the accuracy, number one, but number two, how much care was going into vetting these stories? What you're seeing on screen here, the sources, <clears throat> the main sources for these articles were the main key players involved in the program. So my questions as time went on and this confusion began to really mount was, why were there so many variations and why weren't anybody really getting it right? 
because all of these couldn't be right. So why was there this confusion when their sources were those involved? Was it careless journalism? I could buy that. Was it bad sources? I don't know. But that's why these issues were being pushed. This was one of the first declassified documents from the intelligence community that I got through FOIA, uh, that in fact, uh, anybody got through FOIA. This was the first one ever. It as well said aviation. This comes from a system called Intellipedia. This is used by the CIA, the NSA, uh, all of the different arms of the intelligence community as a whole. Uh, they use this. So again, even internally, referencing the New York Times and the use of, of an article that used aerospace, they flipped it and said aviation. Why? No one really knows. Here is the statement I got in February of 2019. It took that long for the DIA to finally say, uh, while it was at DIA, it was advanced aerospace. Now, again, <clears throat> I'll say it a thousand times, that upsets a lot of people, this whole name debate. Some people say, well, who really cares? My point was starting with all of that is to show you that confusion started on day one, and it has not gotten better as it continues with the publishing of this book. On top of the publishing of the book, they laid, in my opinion, a bombshell when it comes to critiquing past coverage. It's one thing for, you know, peon John Greenwald to say it and harp on the New York Times or whomever that got it wrong. But when the OSAP former director, who has not been disputed by the Pentagon, uh, when that guy comes out and, and authors a book that said, and I, I quote on page 156 for those who have the book, unfortunately, the ATIP details presented in these articles and news programs were actually those of OSAP. And in fact, many of those details themselves were in error. Senator Harry Reid said himself in the forward to the book on page, uh, what is that, 24 in Roman numerals, the New York Times article created enormous confusion by mistakenly linking the $22 million funding to the small informal ATIP initiative. The $22 million was specifically targeted only to OSAP. ATIP, as used by the New York Times, was not OSAP, and OSAP was not ATIP. The $22 million was contracted through the Defense Intelligence Agency into OSAP to evaluate the threat potential of UAPs. Not a dollar of that sum went to ATIP despite widespread statements over the last several years. Page 160 of the Skinwalkers book says one of the purposes of this book is to correct the record. So they are stating quite simply, they want to set the record straight. And by doing so, they're saying pretty much everything that was reported uh, was mislabeled and wrong. Now, that's, those are big claims to make because it wasn't just Politico and New York Times that reported it. The avalanche trickled to hundreds and arguably thousands of of mainstream media outlets around the world. If they were all wrong, the question mark is, how were they all wrong? A lot of them were wrong because I call it copy and paste journalism. They were just taking other articles and jumbling the words and making it their own. In my opinion, this is just an opinion, insert graphic, you know, that says uh, uh, John Greenwald's opinion. But I believe that the book is placing blame without placing blame. They said on page 156, the main source for the Times article was Lou Elizondo, who had recently resigned, who had recently, uh, and, uh, I apologize, I don't know how I uh, repeated that. Uh, the main source for the Times article was Lou Elizondo, who had recently resigned from his Pentagon position and joined TTSA and Director of Global Security and Special Programs. Again, that was page 156. Now, remember, in the last slide, I said that all of the facts that they were saying that as reported by the times and those articles were wrong. So in essence, they're saying this was the source. So the question mark is, how did the source um, not convey those facts accurately? I'm not blaming Mr. Elizondo, by the way, that's not what I'm saying. The book is. Uh, so that's what they say in the same section. Articles were wrong, and this was their source. They didn't name anybody else. So was it possible that not one, but two articles that broke this story from two major mainstream media outlets, both somehow mysteriously got the same facts wrong? Uh, that doesn't make sense to me whatsoever. So there's a lot of layers to that onion, 
which we you know have yet to see. As the story continued to unfold, even more confusion came out. This was an interview earlier this year from, uh, with Robert Bigelow on Mystery Wire. George Knapp, credit to him for sitting down uh, face-to-face with Robert Bigelow and asking him some questions. In that interview, uh, this is one thing Robert Bigelow said. I met Lou a couple of times. He didn't, uh, didn't really, he didn't play a role in our program in any way in terms of who we ever reported to or whoever we discussed kind of things with. Um, and then he goes on to talk about James Lekatsky, not by name, but referring to him as the program manager. Now, in this interview, it is clear that Luis Elizondo had no role in OSAP and they didn't communicate. He was not somebody that they ever reported to or whoever we discussed the kinds of things with. Okay, fair point, right? until you start looking at what other people said to the same journalist. This, for me, is cause to question. George Knapp, in an interview back in 2018, June to be exact, he sat down with Luis Elizondo. Luis Elizondo stated when George Knapp asked this, interaction between you and your group and the OSAP Bigelow Bass folks, conversations back and forth, you got a general idea what they're doing, Luis Elizondo, he replies in the affirmative. He says, of course, yeah, we didn't do anything without talking to each other. How do you have those statements from two of these individuals go hand in hand? You don't. One, who's the billionaire who got the funding from the DIA to do their program, said, Lou Elizondo, sure, nice guy, we never talked. Lou Elizondo says, yep, we didn't do anything without talking to each other. Those are not small details. That is a major conflict of statement between two main players of this story. Who's right and who's wrong? Well, we kind of don't really know. To add even more confusion, Dr. Hal Putoff. We know him as being involved on the Bass side. He was a contractor through Bass. This was something that he gave to me in June of 2019. This was about the Pentagon statement that Luis Elizondo had no assigned responsibilities on the ATIP program. So I wrote about this extensively. Some people hate me for some of those articles. Uh, Others, uh, I think, saw the value of digging in because what happened? Well, we got Dr. Hal Putoff on the record as he submitted this statement, and I'll read it in part. However, I have no problem asserting that as an OSAP, slash ATIP contractor and senior advisor, I continued to attend meetings, provide briefings, gain access to videos, provide proposed program plans, meet with staff, etc., all under the aegis of Elizondo's leadership and responsibility for maintaining continuity of the program effort and goals until he resigned. Well, that's great. He's now vouching for him. The question mark, however, is that Bass's contract didn't go after 2010. Now, it could be assumed that Dr. Hal Putoff stayed on. If Luis Elizondo took over in 2010, and we'll go over that timeline in a minute, Dr. Hal Putoff then stayed on as a consultant. Okay, I can see that. Kind of interesting that Bass is cut out, but one of their contractors stays in. Um, So that's interesting how that may have unfolded. There's a lot of uncharted territory there that I don't really see anybody talking about. But I responded to Dr. Putoff and said, hey, can you elaborate? So are you saying that after 2010, you as either a Bass contractor or somebody who, what, didn't work for Bass and then later got a contract direct with the Pentagon to consult with or uh, do whatever, you know, could consult with or do whatever duties you had with Luis Elizondo's ATIP? Uh, Well, that could be true as well, but James Lekatsky said ATIP was never funded. So then the question mark is, who wrote Dr. Hal Putoff's statement, uh, uh, paycheck? So based on this statement, if he stayed on, there's got to be funding from somewhere. I mean, in my opinion, and I don't fault anybody for this, you're not going to volunteer your time. So my guess is who's paying? And, and, and that's where a lot of the layers, when it comes to the Pentagon's ATIP side, start to come into question. Because if Bass was out, how did Dr. Putoff stay in? He never responded to my follow-up to try and figure out what happened. 
<clears throat> it only got worse. We were told and we were, you know, shown documentation, and I'll go over that documentation also in a minute, that OSAP started in 2008 after it was awarded to Bass. Well, in a Dr. Hal Putoff lecture that he gave to a conference in Las Vegas in June of 2018, he said the following, people have trouble trying to get documents out of the Pentagon by saying they want all documents on ATIP and they have a hard time because that wasn't the actual name of the program. Advanced Aerospace Weapons Systems Application Program is the actual name of the program. But ATIP was the nickname it went by. It began in June of 2007. The Defense Intelligence Agency was concerned about the fact that obvious observation had shown that advanced aerospace vehicles, crafts or drones of unknown origin, were flying all over the United States over waters, in fact globally, as was the case. Did you catch it? It began in June of 2007. Now that's more than a full year prior to money ever being allocated to the OSAP contract in August of 2008. So what happened there? Now put a pin in that because when I go over the timeline, you'll see something else emerge that creates yet another question. This was also echoed to George Knapp in a Mystery Wire interview uh, by Luis Elizondo because that really wasn't a, a quote, I should say, because that really wasn't. That started before I came on board and therefore my knowledge of it is a bit limited. So in essence, in 2007, the initial program was called OSAP program. It was that name uh, for about nine months, and that program was later refined. It was a bit of a shotgun approach to the phenomena. So yet again, we have a 2007 start date, but yet again, documentation and all reporting contradicts that. Now, despite the controversy about the Pentagon saying, no, Luis Elizondo had no assigned responsibility on the ATIP program. Let's get beyond that and find out when he started. Now, we all know for those who watched the History Channel special Unidentified, they went over a lot of Elizondo's background and they said the following. These are three screenshots with the official transcript. Uh, these were taken, I uh, believe, uh, through my press access to the History Channel where they allowed us to screen ahead of time. Uh, I did not post these until after the show aired, but that's uh, kind of the screen you're seeing. And then since then, I believe you can view this publicly, or at least you did uh, for a while, but anybody can verify this. They said in that show, which uh, Luis Elizondo was instrumental in, the narrator says, in 2009, Elizondo took over the $22 million Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. Well, that's entirely wrong across the board based on all of the new details that have emerged. Uh, Luis Elizondo, which you'll see in a second, says, well, 2010, the $22 million, according to James Lekatsky, never went to ATIP. So yet again, how did a television show that was working directly with the sources get it wildly wrong? Now, maybe the producers just made a mistake and sure we can chalk it up to that. Uh, but was there something else? Luis Elizondo, in one of his interviews, said the OSAP program, given the resources, $22 million, would never be enough to really follow each and every uh, down each and every rabbit hole to do this conclusively, in my opinion, anyways. So it was refocused to ATIP. I took over in 2010. So yet another discrepancy on the timeline. What is going on? All these details, by the way, do mean an awful lot when you're trying to figure out what the right story is. That timeline defines money, where the money came from, who was involved, who was calling the shots. And let's just face it, essentially, who's telling the truth? Not everybody can be right. And all of these little details, sure, people can get date, dates wrong. Uh, it was now, what, 11 going on 12 years ago-ish, uh, depending upon uh, what version you go for. So that's cool. You know, Maybe some of these are just all mistakes. But you know, when you're talking about something this sensitive, in my opinion, uh, and again, an opinion here that I'd like to insert, we should take a little bit more care. Again, I'm not saying who's right or who's wrong in this presentation, but rather pointing out the huge discrepancies in the timeline, the story, the claims, the facts, and what we've been led to believe. 
in a presentation that was done to MUFON, uh, this was edited to uh, down a little bit and put onto to the Stars Academy of Arts and Sciences or TTSA's YouTube channel. Slides were shown by Luis Elizondo. In one of those slides, you'll see the highlighted purple one. Highlight was my uh, emphasis. 2008. OSAP is formally changed to ATIP by former program manager to focus more narrowly on the five observables and research of advanced physics applications. But as we know, in the book anyway, for those who read it, it was only said that it was a nickname, that ATIP was never anything within the DIA, and that the ATIP that we know it was an unfunded, unofficial and the, they use the word unofficial program operated out of the Pentagon. So what happened in 2008, according to Mr. Elizondo, two full years, or at least close to two years prior to him taking over, that ATIP had already been morphed and uh, fo used to, to, to focus in on these five observables. That is not checking out with the new information that has come forward. In 2009, this kind of reinforces that in 2008, a transfer to ATIP or a formal repackaging, so to speak, likely didn't take place. <clears throat> Excuse me. In 2009, this Harry Reid letter uh, was written, essentially trying to get SAP access or special access program status for what we refer to as ATIP. But in the book, it kind of shows that this was an introduction of the ATIP word, that this was an unclassified way of referring to OSAP, which uh, essentially took the spotlight off of this program that they wanted to remain secret and essentially created a nickname. They said in the book, and again, this is from the free preview, based on preliminary data, a letter had already been sent from Senator Harry Reid to Deputy Secretary of Defense William Lynn on June 24th, 2009, requesting a SAP or special access program for OSAP. As detailed in Chapter 10, the decision to create the SAP was postponed, but the urgent need persisted. Oddly enough, the primary legacy of the letter was the new unclassified nickname, the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, or ATIP, created exclusively for use within the unclassified letter. The ATIP acronym was adopted much later to describe a small, unofficial effort within the DOD to investigate UAPs encountered by the military. The New York Times article in December of 2017 mistakenly linked the $22 million in funding to ATIP, not OSAP. OSAP was the change. OSAP was the official name of the $22 million program and was never changed. ATIP was not a funded program. Now that's completely contradictory to what we've been told about how OSAP morphed to ATIP in 2008. Well, the book is completely contradicting that narrative and it isn't right. What's interesting to point out about Harry Reid is the shifting of viewpoints when it comes to this, because in 2009, he had said in his letter that he had seen enough to try and get what he was referring to as ATIP, a SAP status. But years later, he did an interview and a journalist asked him, were you ever briefed on the findings of, of, of the program and, and were you, you staying involved? Uh, in the New York Magazine article published in March of 2018, the journalist says, when the program was running, was this something that you would be briefed on frequently? Were you briefed on it ever? Harry Reid said, no, I left everybody alone. Nope. Journalist followed up, you were never briefed? Harry Reid says, that, that's not my style. Nope. How is it that you, as a senator, would essentially go and fight for SAP status on something, which by the way, I cannot find any example outside of this storyline of a sitting U.S. Senator getting involved in a program that's already underway, trying to request certain status in this, in this manner. That doesn't mean that it hasn't happened. That's just kind of unorthodox. Once funding goes, Senators aren't generally involved in the day-to-day -day business of DIA or NSA or CIA or DOD or whomever. So the fact that he was involved 
shows you that there was something else going on. He had obviously been briefed enough, which, by the way, I don't think I pulled it, but uh, there's a quote about them briefing Harry Reid in the book, I think. So, you know, it, it, it shows that what version of his story do you want to believe? Because as time goes on, we're getting more and more information that is simply creating more and more confusion and generating more and more questions than it is answers. In a Mystery Wire interview, again, credit to George uh, Knapp, Yes, the name ATIP, and this is from James Lekatsky, quote, Yes, the name ATIP was a nickname for OSAP for certain security reasons that we've put into the book. But the difference between OSAP with the nickname ATIP at DIA and ATIP at the Pentagon is quite distinct. OSAP had $22 million in funding. It covered military and civilian UFOs, yielding a massive database. It also had a main contract and subcontracts. Now, ATIP in the Pentagon, as described in the articles, was basically zero-funded, looked at specific military UFO encounters, and very important ones because they had film and it had no contract. So getting back to how did this mix-up occur, I think it's not deliberate, it's not due to authors, to television personalities, etc. It's the fact that we were running not an official app, but a closed program, and he goes on and on. So is who's to blame for the confusion? I'm not really sure. But when you talk about the key players involved, none of them agree either. So we can talk about the media in one breath. And that's fine. I've done that on this channel before. And I've made extensive videos about the horrible, um, the, 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 the horrible reporting when it comes to this topic. But now when you look at the actual statements from everybody and the storylines and and what comes out in books like this and you know rumor has it there's more books coming uh when you look at all of that and nothing matches up what are we as the general public led to believe about this was this all kosher and up and up and that brings me to my next section which really upsets some people but it is something that truly puts all of this into context. Now, for many years, I've talked about the concept of a sweetheart deal. Now, essentially, in plain English, what I mean by that is the fact that that OSAP was a creation for Bass to get X amount of dollars in the tunes of tens of millions, if not a lot more. I don't believe that $22 million was supposed to be a cap, but tens of millions of dollars in a program that was catered for Robert Bigelow and Bass. Now that happens in government and military. So I'm sorry, it just happens, right? It's not something that I like or dislike, but it's the reality of what's going on. But it also puts into proper context what it is that we're actually dealing with and what it is that we're actually talking about. Now, one of the main things on why I get attached to this is a lot of you who are watching this are into UFOs and you know me as somebody who loves the topic, and I do. I preface a lot of what I do with saying I believe the phenomena is real. I believe it warrants scientific scrutiny. I believe funding should be put forward uh, to look into it, and I fully support the UAP task force and its mission to try and uncover what all this is. But in the same respect, I am a researcher and an investigator who has dug in for decades through the Freedom of Information Act on information that goes well beyond UFOs. And where I uh, want to bring this up is this is a crossroads for me. Uh, because I take personal biases, or I try. I'm only human. Of course, I'm going to have, you know, something in it that 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 is within me that makes me lean a certain way. But I truly try hard uh, not to do that. And this is a crossroads for me because I want all of this to be real, and I look into it uh, for the reason that I, I believe that there's something to the UFO topic. Uh, but in the same respect, I look into a lot of government waste and wasteful spending and through the years have gotten, you know, quite a few different news uh, agencies and media outlets to cover documents that I've come out with on various topics. Uh, a prime example was years ago, quite a few years with one of those stimulus packages, how they spent $18 million 
uh, for the recovery.gov website. Like how does a website cost $18 million and for it to be a, a disaster? Um, ProPublica also had a lawsuit to get a, a lot of that stuff out. Uh, so, so credit to them as well involved in those stories. $16.7 million for canned pork. Uh, and so I've got the FDA contract on all of that craziness. $1.5 million for cheese. And, and, and it goes on and on. So that's what I do. And this is where the concept of a sweetheart deal, whether or not it deals with UFOs or not, comes into play for me because that's who I am as a researcher and somebody who looks into these topics and looks at a $22 million dollar sign and whether or not this truly was appropriated properly. And what if that $22 million went to the, you know, let's say Office of Naval Intelligence for the UAP task force or wherever, could that have been appropriated more properly where they don't focus on, let's say, cryptozoology stuff and, and cryptids and dino beavers and <laughs> some other stuff that, that, that I can't say without laughing that rather if you focused on the nuts and bolts aspect of this phenomena that we know is real, what could that $22 million have purchased elsewhere? So that's that crossroads for me. But I want to deal a little bit with that sweetheart deal narrative because for years I've talked about it as a possibility. And you know what, with the with the publishing of, of this book uh, and now James Lekatsky on the record, truly not third hand information, but his words in a book with his name on it, I believe now it's solidified. Solidified that it is a sweetheart deal. Does that take away from results before I dig into this? No, of course not. Where are the results is the question. So even though I don't believe that it takes away from the results, my big question is, where are those results? And if there was something yielded from the $22 million, where is it? And if it's classified and heavily classified at that, then they wouldn't be talking about OSAP and ATIP and writing books about it because the idea concepts and these findings and realities of dino beavers and uh, man-like wolves or whatever, uh, that if that all happened, you're not going to be able to talk about that if it's highly classified. So if it is unclassified and they're able to talk about it, where are the results? And that is one of the biggest questions that we still have yet to answer when we get into this concept of a sweetheart deal. Because if this was truly a sweetheart deal and the money was catered for Robert Bigelow and he doesn't want to share it, uh, I'm not, not saying that that's the reality, but where is everything? If that is the reality, then we have a lot more questions than even I thought uh, about this whole thing. So anyway, concept of a sweetheart deal. So these are some of the, the facts that we've learned here uh, in the last few years and some uh, with this book as well. We know that Robert Bigelow, this man over here, owns Bigelow Aerospace and who created the subsidiary that we know as Bass as the one that got this contract. We know that Senator Harry Reid is instrumental in that. There's there's really kind of no debating that. Uh, Robert Bigelow's headquarters is in Nevada. And when this man, Senator Harry Reid, uh, was the majority leader and, and uh, was in the Senate, he was in so for the state of Nevada. So these guys were obviously in the same state and with the success of a billionaire who creates jobs and creates uh, money flowing into that state, this man here is obviously very happy. So there is motivation for the one to take care of of the other. Now, the other two gentlemen that don't get mentioned a whole lot, uh, and we just hear again third hand information, would be Senators Ted Stevens and Daniel Inouye, both of which are the late. They have both passed away. So that's why I say most of uh, what we hear is all third hand information, uh, and we don't really know the role. I'm sorry, if any, that they really played uh, in getting that. We just have to believe and, and trust uh, the book itself. We've learned that Harry Reid's connection to Robert Bigelow goes back to the NIDS days, back to 1996 when Reid had attended one of the board meetings for NIDS, and he was very impressed by it. Lots of scientists, lots of, uh, you know, big names, uh, not the, the, the tinfoil hat people that I'm sure most politicians are scared of. These were big people. That apparently is the root 
of Harry Reid's interest in Robert Bigelow, NIDS, all things UFOs, paranormal, Skinwalker Ranch, and uh, and it's rooted back uh, to 1996. Now, we know the connection then between Robert Bigelow and Harry Reid extended far beyond uh, friendship. There were also... Uh, in the tunes of thousands of dollars worth of donations from not only Robert Bigelow, but also his late wife, Diane Bigelow, all under the uh, banners, a lot of times under the Bigelow companies, uh, Bigelow Development Aerospace LLC. Uh, and it probably extends farther beyond this. I just don't know all the names of everybody, uh, but these are all verifiable contributions all through um 2004, uh, a little bit before, then a couple years later, OSAP was awarded. And then these thousands of dollars of donations from uh, Robert Bigelow, ironically, around the time that they were saying that they were cutting the OSAP funding, uh, which is, um, you know, pr probably just a coincidence. Uh, but obviously, again, a, a relationship that extends far beyond the professions or, or just a, a friendship that there were thousands of dollars in donations that were going forward. Enter James Lekatsky. He, again, was the DIA scientist. He was a rocket scientist who, in the leaked reports, uh, that's really how we knew his name before, but nobody wanted to say his name. Uh, he was on the leaked reports as being the OSAP program manager. And so that also was a cause for confusion. Hey, what about Mr. Elizondo? Didn't he? Wasn't he the manager? What is this? And uh, in the early days, that really caused a lot of confusion. Since then, we got clarity that uh, Mr. Elizondo said, hey, we uh, were two different programs. He led OSA, or excuse me, ATIP. Uh, Elizondo led ATIP in the Pentagon. Lekatsky was OSAP at the DIA. Dr. Lekatsky says the following on page 20, for those who have the book, Reading Hunt for the Skinwalker, which is, uh, by the way, the original book that was written by George Knapp and I think Colm Kelleher, uh, as well about Skinwalker Ranch created uh, quite a bit of hoopla many, many years ago. Uh, so back to the quote, I'm sorry. Reading Hunt for the Skinwalker back in March of 2007 intrigued Lekatsky. I read the book cover to cover, Lekatsky says. I was legitimately interested in this as useful to the military and useful to my particular group, which was looking at possible threats to new weapons systems. That's what attracted my attention. So that kind of gives a time frame, March of 2007. Lekatsky gets a personal interest into Skinwalker Ranch, specifically this ranch in Utah that allegedly has all of this paranormal activity. There's a little flow chart for you. In 2007, this is from Senator Harry Reid, by the way, page, um, what is that, 14 uh, in the uh, Roman numeral. In 2007, I received a telephone call from Bob Bigelow regarding a letter he had received from the Defense Intelligence Agency, or DIA. That also timestamps it that Lekatsky writes Robert Bigelow and says, I want to visit Skinwalker Ranch. Bigelow immediately turns around and calls his buddy Harry Reid to kind of have everything checked out. As the story slash legend goes, if you want to call it that, Lekatsky visits the, the um, uh, Skinwalker Ranch and actually has, which he recounts in the book, a paranormal experience. And he's convinced at this point that money needs to go to this research. Now, again, keep in mind, that this is 2007, according to the book. Enter Harry Reid, Ted Stevens, Daniel Inouye, that they, according to Senator Harry Reid on page uh, 16 in the Roman numeral, quote, thus the Advanced Aerospace Weapon System Applications Program was conceived. Senators Stevens, Inouye, and I allocated $22 million to get the program started. A government request for a proposal was put out, and Bob Bigelow's company secured the bid. That was the $22 million that went to Bass. According to the Pentagon, this is how it was funded. The program commenced in fiscal year 2008 with $10 million appropriated in the Defense Supplemental Appropriation Act. The first 26 reports were complete, completed by late 2009. The Defense Appropriation Act for fiscal year 2010 included an additional $12 million for the program, and 12 additional reports were produced. 
That's quoted from Susan Goff, Pentagon spokesperson. That culminated from DIA statements and so on and so forth. Uh, I'm putting her name because that was the last time I received a version of it. Uh, but James Kudlaw from DIA also gave me portions of that. Even goes back to Audricia Harris from the Pentagon in uh, early 2018 when I was communicating with her back then. Senator Harry Reid, also on page uh, 16, as the United States Senate Majority Leader, I decided to meet in a classified location in the United States Capitol with two key members of the appropriations process. The two members of the appropriations committee who controlled the dark money, the non-public money, were Republican Senator Ted Stevens of Alaska and Democratic Senator Dan Inouye of Hawaii. Now, I'm bringing up this because dark money has come up, the, the phrasing dark money has come up quite a few times when it comes to Harry Reid. And to be blatantly honest with you, uh, and I could be completely off base or missing something big, I have no idea what in the hell he's referring to. When you talk about black budget program, sure, I uh, obviously know what he's referring to. Dark money is something different and really doesn't have to do with government spending, but rather uh, corporations, namely nonprofit corporations, and how they donate to political campaigns. Ironically, one of the biggest outspoken senators on dark money was Senator Harry Reid himself. These two articles I pulled from various years, 2014 and 2015, Harry Reid says dark money in campaigns threatens democracy. Another headline, Harry Reid joins call for Obama to take action on dark money. Now, I don't believe he's using the right phrasing, and it completely contradicts the Pentagon uh, and what they are documenting in these fiscal year acts and the appropriations bills on what Senator Harry Reid is doing. So I'm not sure what he's referring to. If there's something I'm missing, please, guys, help me out. Uh, I believe that maybe he's just erroneously referring to black budget money. Um, but uh, even that doesn't make sense because according to the Pentagon, they fully admit the money was on the books and they show where it came from. On top of that, Senator Harry Reid in this book said that he and the two other senators allocated $22 million. Well, I would politely argue that was impossible for him to do. He could get the original money or put it in a bill somehow, but there was no cap. If you look at the documentation of what OSAP was all about, it was supposed to extend far beyond two years, maybe even to five years and beyond. But after a review in 2009, after uh, the DIA had started it, they felt they were not getting anything beneficial. So then the funding was cut after that second year. George Knapp was the one that showed screenshots of the first contract that was signed for that first year. The total amount, $10 million. It coincides with what the Pentagon says. There's, in my opinion, no way that Senator Harry Reid then could understand, number one, that they would get a second year because it was an option, but number two, that it would be for the total of $12 million. So Senator Harry Reid, or in my opinion, any senator for that matter, or committee, or whatever, in 2008, or excuse me, 2007, I think he said in the book, uh, they couldn't allocate $22 million because the bills weren't even written yet. And that money that came from those bills wasn't even determined yet. So for that whole portion of the story, and I know it sometimes gets dicey and confusing when you start talking about this level stuff, it shows that I believe Senator Harry Reid is wrong. And I'm sorry, his use of the word dark money makes no sense to this story. But he's used that so many times, I had to point it out. And on top of that, Senator Reid was against the true definition of dark money as a whole. Going back to the idea of that, that sweetheart deal, we know from a statement that I got uh, back in March of 2019 that there was only one bidder on this contract that could have potentially equaled tens of millions of dollars should the option go to five years and beyond. The fact that no other contractor would try and bid on a public notice in 2008 doesn't make really any sense. Now, some have argued that that's normal and that's fine. Okay, so let's get beyond it. I won't, I won't beat the dead horse, but Bigelow Aerospace was the 
only bitter. That has never been disputed. It was reported, however, erroneously, that Lockheed put a bid in. That also was wrong. Senator Harry Reid has said in interviews that he uh, put the bid solicit, or excuse me, that the government put the bid solicitation out and that Bass got it because they were the most qualified. At the time, he never said they were the only one. So what are the odds that this bid solicitation, which I'll show you here, called the Advanced Aerospace Weapon System Applications Program, goes out for public bids and nowhere, nowhere, in that public bid solicitation is Skinwalker Ranch mentioned, or uh, excuse me, are UFOs or paranormal mentioned, which would make Skinwalker Ranch incredibly valuable to bid on a contract like that saying, hey, if you want to look in the paranormal, we have the prime spot for you or whatever. None of that was in the public bid solicitation. So what are the odds that out of all of those corporations, LLCs, or whomever is cleared to bid on a contract, the one person that actually bids on it strikes the jackpot because its CEO, Robert Bigelow, has this invested interest in UFOs and paranormal. So we're led to believe that OSAP, when it went out, withheld some of those other details from the public bid notice because some have argued they were classified. Others say that they were embarrassed by it. Yeah, pick your explanation, doesn't matter. But man, did Robert Bigelow hit the jackpot when he just got lucky and was the only bidder that allowed him to do paranormal funhouse research? Or was he tipped off? Now let's face it, he was tipped off. You can't get around that. If, if we wanna believe otherwise, that's fine. But there's no way that a DIA scientist a year prior that then uh, a year prior to this contract being awarded calls Robert Bigelow wants to go to Skinwalker Ranch has a paranormal experience comes back sets the the deals in motion to get word to Harry Reid twenty two million dollars comes out of nowhere and boom this goes out for a public bid and voila Bass is the only bidder no the reality is he was tipped off and this was catered to him. Another thing emerged, too, while looking at this book and kind of going over the documentation again, this is a copy of version number three of the official notice for bid solic solicitations. Why I say version three is there are three versions, not a whole lot of difference. It changed a couple little details, but it really didn't change the scope of the of the program. They just save all the revisions online on the blackvault.com search the search engine for OSAP, you will be able to download all of the different versions. I have everything archived. But while doing this presentation, this was the date that you'll notice here, solicitation issue date, August 18th, 2008. That's when it went out. That is when uh, the DIA said, hey, we want solicitations for this bid. The due date was September 5th, so pretty tight. You didn't have a whole lot of time to submit for this uh, bid. Uh, arguable on whether or not that's standard or not, but uh, irrelevant for, for my presentation here. So we'll just call it September 5th. Those dates are also backed up by SAM.gov, or which is now the Fine Business Opportunities website. Uh, I believe SAM.gov has been uh, rebranded, uh, but this is the archived version. So September 5th was the due date. And of course, uh, other websites as well, all archived, all verify September 5th was the due date. Now, why do I uh, say that? Well, because um, the book has September 10th, uh, so that could just be a typo. But then in the appendix on page 184, they talk about the proposals that Bass submitted to the Defense Intelligence Agency saying, hey, look, we're the guy for you. Uh, they were submitted uh, three days after the, the due date. Uh, what happened there? I'm not really sure, but it's a discrepancy worth noting because, well, the due date was done. So if nobody else was there, what happened? I I don't know. I really don't have an answer to it, uh, but it's important nonetheless. This was the statement of objectives. Uh, this was the essentially what OSAP was all about. This also is from that version three document. No mention of paranormal. No mention of you know uh, UFOs or, or or anything in that genre. Uh, it was all about looking at advanced uh, aerospace technology and forward looking into the 40 years into the future, uh, looking at various lift propulsion, uh, so on and so forth on how things 
uh, essentially could progress. And that's what this was supposedly all about. In that same document, from the get-go, the program manager or the contracting officer was Dr. James Lekatsky, the same guy that visited Skinwalker Ranch and reached out to Bigelow Aerospace the year prior. So, you know, it seems like it was kind of set up and in the book goes into even more detail about how Dr. Lekatsky was instrumental in that. So if we haven't really figured out that this was catered for Bass and Robert Bigelow yet, I'm not sure how else to put it, but this book solidifies that fact. Now, here's kind of a timeline of events. Some points are review, some points are new, but this is how it all unfolded. March of 2007, Lekatsky read Hunt for the Skinwalker. The next month, Lekatsky meets in the Defense Warning Office with Jonathan Axelrod, uh, believed to be just a nickname, to talk about tales of the paranormal. He is within, the, the DWO was within the DIA, or Defense Intelligence Agency. Axelrod takes the book to Iraq while deployed. Somehow that, you know, gets the ball in motion that all of this was, uh, you know, real. June 19, 2007, Lekatsky writes to Robert Bigelow on DIA letterhead to ask to visit his ranch. Now, remember when I told you to put a pin in that Dr. Putoff uh, quote, and then later Elizondo had a 2007 start date for OSAP? That was all June of 2007 when they said that it started. So is this the start of OSAP? Did they, did they already start putting money towards Bigelow? Did they already choose him? Why are multiple key players involved saying 2007? Contract wasn't awarded until more than a year later. And according to, you know, reports, they weren't aware of it. They were just the lucky bidder. So how did all that happen and how is it connected? Not really sure, but it was an interesting date correlation when going through the book. The next month, July 26, 2007, Lekatsky and Bigelow fly to Utah to visit his ranch. Within 60 minutes of being on the property, Lekatsky had paranormal experiences seeing, quote, unearthly technological device that had, quote, silently appeared out of nowhere in the adjacent kitchen. It looked to be a complex, semi-opaque, yellowish tubular structure. That's page 39 and 40 for those who have the book. In 2007 as well, but it's an unknown month, but we know that it's post Lekatsky's ranch visit, Bigelow briefed long-term friend, as the book calls him, Senator Harry Reid on extraordinary history of UAPs at the UAP at the Utah ranch, excuse me, as well on the recent astounding experience by a high-level DIA analyst on the same ranch. It did not take long to connect Jim Lekatsky with Senators Daniel Inouye of Hawaii and Ted Stevens of Alaska in a Capitol building meeting. January of 2008, I tracked down the documentations, the, the documentation from the Nevada Secretary of State that shows that Bigelow Aerospace Advanced Space Studies, or BASS, as a, was formed as a domestic limited liability company in Nevada. It was reported as well, BASS was set up only for OSAP, the OSAP contract. If that's the case, seems like he had prior knowledge. If that's not the case, heck of a coincidence. August 2008, OSAP bid solicitation notice is published in the Biz Ops website. September 5th, OSAP bids were due. September 8th, BAS proposal volumes 1 through 3 were submitted. And September 22nd, 2008, the OSAP contract was issued to BAS. I know I spent a lot of time on the sweetheart deal, but that frames what we are dealing with. And in my book, absolutely closes the deal uh, when it comes to the sweetheart deal argument. Does that negate the findings? No, but where are the findings? And that question still lingers to this day. Those findings could be in the reports that a lot of people are now referring to James Lekatsky's chapter in chapter three of the book. Voluminous high quality material, more than a hundred separate reports as detailed in appendix one, was submitted to the DIA in just over two years of the program's existence. In addition, the 11 databases within the OSAP BAS data warehouse were delivered to DIA, while the massive holdings of the original analyst journals, data, and photographs remained in storage. Now, those databases I'll talk about in a couple of minutes, uh, but we have yet to refer to them in this presentation. In short, BAS, 
is said to have created 11 different databases, all encompassing UF, UAP, UFO events, witness testimony, all sorts of material. That's what those 11 databases are. But don't worry, I'll, I'll get to those. A lot of those reports are probably spelled out in that original bid solicitation notice. So a lot of it, I'm not sure, is it being framed to be much more interesting than it is? These types of reports like, um, you know, management plans for different tasks, travel reports, expenses, so on and so forth, all do for contracts like this. But is that what he's talking about with the hundreds of reports? Uh, I don't really know because the only thing we do know uh, came through a Freedom of Information Act request I did, and I know that the Federal um, Federation, excuse me, of American Scientists or, or FAS, uh, Stephen Aftergood to be uh, precise, they as well had a case ongoing, as did I, for uh, the, and I'll read it here, all communications to and from the DIA with the Armed Services Committee in 2017 and in 2018 regarding the advanced aviation. And at this time when I filed, that's how the government referred to it, uh, advanced aviation threat identification program or referred to as the advanced aerospace threat identification program or referred to uh, as the advanced aerospace threat and identification program. That was Harry Reid's version. The result was a letter that was written to John McCain uh, in January of 2018. And this is where we uh, discovered the reality of the DIRD reports. And those DIRD reports were the 38 reports that were created under the OSAP contract. Now, I'm going to read to you part of this letter because one word is key. Based on interest from your staff regarding the DIA's role in ATIP, please find attached a list of all products produced under the ATIP contract for DIA to publish. The purpose of ATIP was to investigate foreign advanced aerospace weapon threats from the present out to the next 40 years. And again, we know 38 reports were given. I dug it up in the congressional record log also in April of 2018. They also punched the uh, published uh, word. A letter from the Chief Congressional Relations Division Defense Intelligence Agency, DOD, transmitting a list of all products produced under the Advanced Aerospace Threat and Identification Program contract for the DIA to publish to the Committee of Armed Services. So I was able to kind of dig up that this letter was referred to in official congressional record. They received these three pages, which listed all 38 reports. So that uh, is a breakdown of the published reports through ATIP. Notice how the letter didn't say OSAP. Now, why not? If ATIP was just a nickname when it came to DIA, um, on paper, that meant nothing to really anybody um, when it came to funding to a senator and so on. So was this the same thing that they're trying to keep it secret? Or is there another layer here that we haven't really <laughs> understood? Uh, but OSAP was not involved. It should be noted, however, that this does kind of coincide with the Pentagon's explanation that ATIP was the overall program and the portion that was contracted out was known as OSAP. Now, according to Lukatsky, uh, OSAP was the program. ATIP was kind of a nickname. And then when you talk to Luis Elizondo, OSAP was a DIA program and ATIP was a DOD program. Um, you know, uh, 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 quite a few different definitions. Dr. Hal Putoff also just calls it a nickname. So uh, pff, who do you believe on that one? Not really sure, uh, but there's a lot of question marks here. Just kind of a quick side note about um, some history here. OSAP as a whole, as a program, looking at forward looking technology and what might be there isn't anything new. I had dug up this uh, program from 1972 called Project Outgrowth. It was headed by a Franklin B. Meade uh, and run through the Air Force Rocket Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, in essence, they were looking at major propulsion developments that may occur in the next 30 to 40 years. It was a forward-looking program, very much like OSAP, and essentially what they were looking for were advancements in propulsion, one of the same exact uh, angles of study for OSAP, and how it may progress over the next 30 to 40 years. Ironically, OSAP was labeled as through the next 40 years. 
do the math from 1972, uh, you're looking at about uh, 35 years or so after Project Outgrowth that OSAP was essentially conceived uh, and born out. So it's a very interesting, maybe just a coincidence correlation that this program preceded OSAP was very much looking at very similar things um, and had a very similar time frame of 40 years looking into the future. You'll see number nine here in the 1970s program was looking at actually how you can propel a ship using your mind or psychokinesis. They labeled it as movement of objects by mental forces, although recent developments indicate small object may be propelled by this technique. Too much basic research is needed before this method can be considered for propulsion ac uh, applications. So they were looking at incredibly fringe areas of science as well. And so uh, now that the Pentagon has kind of revamped their statement, uh, did, did Bigelow insert UFOs in very much a similar fashion? Uh, and then that's where the confusion comes from. Or was this that sweetheart deal? And it was something else entirely on paper. It was, yeah, let's do some research into lift and propulsion and so on and so forth, uh, materials and, and, uh, whatever the other 38 dirt reports are. But in reality, all that money went to paranormal, you know, cryptid research, which is bizarre. Uh, a lot of you asked about Dr. Um, Eric Davis today uh, and whether or not, you know, he's he really briefed in a classified setting about off world vehicles. I'll deal with that in a second. But one interesting thing when when looking at Project Outgrowth and Franklin Mead, as I told you about, this is how tightly niched these these scientists and this research is. And this may mean absolutely nothing, but I kind of found it a little bit fascinating that it, this, it, these documents and programs were separated by decades and decades. Yet when you start digging in, here is a ball lightning study that was awarded to Warp Drive Metrics. That is the company for this man here, Dr. Eric Davis. Now we know that he wrote five of those DIRD reports. I showed you all 38. He had written five of them. He was contracted by his pal, uh, Dr. Hal Putoff, and for an untold amount of money, and he authored these five uh, DIRD reports. What's interesting about this ball lightning study, though, this was outside of OSAP, so it had nothing to do with that. It was written in 2003. But was really interesting was the project manager on Eric Davis's ball lightning study which was Franklin Mead, the same guy that did that OSAP like program decades prior. And in fact, if you continue to dig, you'll see that Eric Davis and Franklin Mead then later would author a document together about laser light craft propulsion. Now, all of this is well over my head when it comes to science, but very interesting that number 31 on the 38 list was about laser light craft technology authored by Dr. Eric Davis. So you can see how tightly niched all of these people and these realms of research really were. And when you dig, you see that they really are connected in the most bizarre way. Now, back to your questions about did he brief Congress about off world vehicles? Now, for those who aren't aware, I did a full video about off-world vehicle technology uh, and the claims made by the New York Times and that horrific journalism job uh, that was later corrected on numerous fronts. They also made corrections that they never noted. I go through that in the video, and I'll be honest with you. I do not believe the claims by Eric Davis that he briefed uh, in a classified setting or otherwise about off-world vehicles. He may have had a meeting. Uh, he may have sat with a senator, congressman, House of Representatives, whomever, uh, committee even, and, and maybe had a meeting. I don't buy that it was a class of, in a classified setting, and I don't buy that he was really driving the point home about, quote-unquote, off-world vehicles. Simply put, 
the existence of off-world vehicles would be a highly classified piece of knowledge. We all know that. Uh, there's no getting away from it. If it wasn't an ATIP or OSAP or whatever really did find it and it was unclassified in nature, you better bet your bottom dollar that Robert Bigelow, Luis Elizondo, James Lekatsky, or any one of those players would have talked about it and confirmed it by now, but they haven't. All we get are these shrouded, convoluted, uh, cloak and dagger type, you know, fun stories that may allude to it, but we never get the confirmation. So let's say it really does exist. The government military has off-world vehicles. Well, let's face it, it would be highly classified. And no, they would not be talking about it or publishing it in the New York Times. And the mess that became of that article with all of the corrections, I think we can all dismiss the notion. And no, I don't believe Dr. Eric Davis is as connected as some people want us to believe. I uh, wanted to address that, though, because of so many questions I got today on social media about it. Those 11 databases that were created, this is one of the last things that I'm going to go over for you guys. And uh, timing wise, it's working out pretty perfect. The data warehouse um, that they created, these 11 databases, again, uh, was a culmination of UFO sightings and witness testimony, hopefully, you know, photos, videos, whatever they may be. Uh, but just it sounds like a massive amount of data. Now, where is that data? According to the book, they turned at least part of it over to the DIA. But the question mark is, where is it now? Is it classified? And if it is, how can you classify something that came from the general public, which is what Dr. Lekatsky said they were looking into? So if I take a picture or a video of a UFO uh, and it's not a top secret aircraft, it is not taken by classified technology, and I am nowhere near a government or military uh, uh, either employee or enlistee, uh, can they classify it? And, and the question for, or ex excuse me, I think the answer to that question uh, would be no. So the now the question is, where is all that data? <laughs> and we have absolutely no idea. I was unaware, and maybe I just missed it, that the... Uh, number of databases totaled 11. I was only aware of one. And the one database, or at least the start of the database anyway, that I was well aware of that really I don't see enough people talking about is the MUFON database. That that has collected for decades upon decades uh, material uh, and, and sightings and photos and videos and so on and so forth. Uh, witness testimony, but on top of that, their personal and confidential information all went into this massive database that was purchased by Robert Bigelow back around the 2008-2009 timeframe. In fact, the actual contract that uh, Bigelow and MUFON signed with each other has no mention of a government program or defense intelligence agency or so on. All we learned from the leak of this um, contract by a MUFON member, the late Elaine Douglas, she brought this out in January of 2011 prior to ever knowing about OSAP or ATIP or BASS uh, being involved with the government. Uh, we learned that it was for the sum of $672,000 that MUFON got in, uh, made payable in 12 installments of $56,000, that that is what Robert Bigelow got into. Now, uh, I, I want to point out because there's a lot to this story, and I'm not going to go into all of it for a couple different reasons, but I will point you to this website here by Roger Glassell and Kurt Collins. I believe it's Kurt's website, uh, but the article itself, the Pentagon UFO Program's Secret Partner, uh, they both authored that, and that is at blueblurrylines.com. Look it up. They do a lot of research and a big deep dive into it. I am not going to do the same. I'm just going to brush the surface and ask you guys a couple of questions because I think a lot of people are really not dealing with this. Now, we made uh, a, we were all kind of made aware of this in 2009, and you'll see it's kind of a blurry picture. This is the best image I can find of it. This much younger and skinnier version of myself. I was the MC of MUFON's International Symposium for about a decade. At the time, this man here was uh, James Carrion. He was the international director of MUFON. And here we have Robert Bigelow. Now, we know Robert Bigelow had invested into MUFON. In turn, they created, I believe this was the origin of their star team, but essentially they were looking for when those UFO reports came in 
and the photos, the videos, whatever, and they went into MUFON, which was the number one place for people to report. Guess who had first dibs on them? Robert Bigelow. But what was not known to the general public at the time was that it was just being funneled right back in to the Defense Intelligence Agency, a military-run intelligence um, agency. So that is one of the biggest aspects to this story that I think we should start pushing on that how can a military arm of our intelligence community, the DIA, want to get into watching what United States citizens see, then keeping that information, but never informing the general public? How much of this gets into very dicey areas? And my first guess would be a lot of it. Yet I don't see a whole lot of people talking about this. And to me, I will, I will just pose this question. Did the DIA even want this? If this was not part of OSAP, then what problems does this create that taxpayer money through a private corporation acquired all of that personal information? Now, this gentleman right here, James Carrion, who I've known for many, many years, wrote a big expose on this that has since been removed. Uh, but you can find it here if you're watching the video on this internet archive link. Uh, Follow the magic thread was his blog. Strange bedfellows was the article. Here's two things that he wrote. Mr. Bigelow did not fund MUFON's work for Bass. Instead, quote, sponsors that Bigelow revealed to John Schusler, who's the uh, one of the founders of MUFON, but not to other MUFON board members, put up the money. That sponsor? The Defense Intelligence Agency. So is this alleging that the DIA, again, that intelligence arm of the United States military, put money in to purchase all of that information? And if so, what ramifications could occur from that? Another thing he wrote, during the project, MUFON provided both historical MUFON files as well as current MUFON case files, including witness information to Bass. To cover MUFON legally, the MUFON UFO reporting form was modified to collect the witness's permission to offer their citing data to a third party, the only third party being Bass. But what happened before that modification took place? All of those other people who felt that hmm, government bad, I see UFO, I go to MUFON because they're good, all of a sudden just had all of their information taken and given right to the United States government. How is any of that kosher or okay? And what makes sense is that the government would not do this because another big problem about all of this is that none of it fits into the purview of the Defense Intelligence Agency's mission. When you look at what the DIA does, they don't investigate U.S. properties in Utah that allege paranormal activity because that's not what they do. They're an intelligence arm that provides mostly foreign intelligence on different types of countries and so on and so forth. So why would they care about this? Now, if they argued that it was the FBI, a domestic law enforcement agency, and they tied in potential uh, criminal activity uh, that that in turn kind of researched some of that paranormal activity. Okay, I can see that, but that's not the story. This is a military intelligence arm that again is the DIA. I don't want to go farther than that, to be blatantly honest, because there's way too much that you can get into about the purchasing of United States citizen information in relation to UFOs and UAPs and what they thought was a confidential submission to a corporation known as MUFON. I will let all of you start asking those questions, but I hope with what this presentation showed you is that there is a lot of unanswered questions and I didn't even scratch the surface. You can look at the statements, interviews, and so on of quite a few of these key players, and you can see how the stories have shifted over time. I call it like a fine wine. In some areas, the stories get better with age. So what's going on? Why, why are we going through this? Now, some, I saw somebody mention on Twitter today, why does it matter at this point? You know, we've got the UAP task force and they're looking at UFOs and all of that is good. 
And you know what? That part is good. And if this is what um, this has has kind of morphed into, then great. I, I, I love that the task force is there. The phenomena deserves that scrutiny and funding, as I said. But in the same respect, we have to look at the root of all of this. And we have to look at what really have we been told in the last few years and how not only this book, but simple research and looking into the claims by many of these people makes a lot of this fall apart. Some of it are dead horses that we've beat for a couple of years now and we'll probably never have answers. Other parts of this stems from the publishing of this book and the revelation by a new voice, an old name but a new voice that is now in the ring. And some of the claims he has made really throw a lot of this for the loop, uh, for a loop. And so when we look at all of that, in the end, we have more questions than answers. We have no idea what that program discovered because in this book, I don't have any, I didn't see any scientific test results that shows that the DIA shows a DNA evidence of a dino beaver or the fact that there's some kind of portal within Skinwalker Ranch or that UF UFOs and UAPs are miraculously skirting all of our uh, coastal defense lines and somehow appearing over this ranch. I don't see that. I see a lot of speculation. I see some great scientists who are a heck of a lot smarter than me. But where are the results? Because if the United States taxpayer funded this, those results are ours and they're ours to share and nobody owns them. This was a contract. OSAP was a contract, not a grant. And with that being said, there's no rhyme or reason if it's not classified and it's not a, a breach of personal confidential information that we should not see it. So this is what, in my opinion, should happen next. We need somebody that is intimately involved in this to say that the results are classified, the results. And if they can't say that, why not? Because if they truly are that classified, we wouldn't have ever heard about OSAP or ATIP. And that is proven by history over time that highly classified programs, whether it be stealth technology, drones, whatever, the mere existence of a program that encompasses top secret technology, classified technology, or whatever, the mere existence of it is classified. You wouldn't be talking about it. So what is it? We need more clarity. And at this point, I don't know who's telling the truth or not. I know who returns my phone calls. I know who is nice, I, but that doesn't make them honest, but I know who is nice. I know who I found common ground with, and I know who dodges me. I believe that these types of questions that I put forward here in the last, whatever it's been, uh, uh, hour and a half or so, these types of questions have to be answered. This is not as clear cut as some people want us to believe. This is not as kosher as some people want us to believe, and it's not as clean as some people want us to believe. It is a mess, and it's a mess because of the main people and players involved that have come out with their respective stories and the fact that none of them align, that they all have contradicting information. And again, some of those are, are dead horses I've beat for quite some time, and some of this is new, but it hasn't gone away. But I fall back on that one point that I'll punch one more time before I say goodnight. And that is if the United States taxpayer funded this, then the results are ours. And if somebody wants to say those results are there, but are classified, then let's get together, work as a team and try and band together and get those results out. If there are no results, then it was a waste of $22 million because they were running around looking at dino beavers and, um, man like wolves or whatever else um, that all could be very cool stuff. And I love that, but it's not DIA money. It's just not uh, that would be better served with, let's say the national science foundation or somewhere else. And that portion of the research, uh, should there be anything to be bore out should be through those agencies and scientific findings should be shared with the general public. But instead we get these cloak and dagger type stories, convoluted statements, 
statements and very few people want to talk. But when they do talk, they only talk to a very few people and it ends up being a mess in the end anyway. So that to me is why with OSAP and ATIP confusion reigns and, com- and questions still linger. And until we get some of those answers and st- until some people want to talk, none of this is going away. And more, I believe, will come out and arise. I will say this one last time, buy it. I, I do believe that everybody should have all the information possible. I only scratched the surface, but I hope that this motivates other people to not be afraid to ask questions. And in the last 48 hours of the recording of this video, I've seen some big players and big names essentially harp on people like myself and others who are asking questions. Well, you know what? I'm a United States taxpayer and I deserve to know the answers if it's not classified or doesn't encroach on somebody's personal confidential information. Other than that, I believe we all should have the answers to this. And that is why I do what I do is to get those answers. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you so much for sticking around. I'm sure I'll do a live Ask Me Anything AMA video soon. But for now, this is John Greenwald Jr. signing off, and we'll see you next time.